as the title of our lesson is entitled, God's Special Jewels, I have some of my special jewels here this evening, some of my family, in addition to Tina, and in addition to Mitch and the two little ones. And so I am delighted to have them here tonight. It means the world to me that they would come and encourage me and encourage you tonight. I'd like for you to turn, if you will, back to the book of Malachi, the third chapter, the passage that was just read so well. And we're going to be talking about some things that I believe are going to prove to be of benefit and encouragement. I believe they will build our faith. They will give us strength. And they will help us to be better when we walk out of this building than we were when we walked in this building tonight. Malachi is a very interesting book, to say the least. The prophet Zechariah, who preceded him, had prophesied greatly about a splendid and a restored temple, the temple that had been destroyed previously by the Babylonians. But as the years passed, things began to wane, and the rays of hope and sunshine began to be darkened by the dark and gray and turbulent skies of indifference, hardship, and disappointment. And so as a result of that, by the time of Malachi, about a generation had passed since Zechariah's ministry ended. The temple had been finished with tremendous celebration. It did not compare to the original temple, but still it was glorious. And it meant something special and significant to God's people. But they allowed that temple to start deteriorating. And they allowed that temple to start being run down. They allowed that temple to start being neglected. And as a result of that, the temple was in disarray. And as God looked down upon his people and upon the temple and upon that which was to represent his presence among them, he was deeply disappointed. But he was also angry. Because if you will read in Malachi, the third chapter, in verse uh, 13, Malachi approaches the book in an interesting way. He approaches it from a question and answer kind of perspective where the people ask a question of God and God answers that question. And so I want you to pay attention because verse 13 really clues us in to where this chapter is going. Your words, and I'll be reading from the New King James translation. Your words have been harsh against me says the Lord. uh, Just stop for a second. Can you imagine the Lord speaking through one of his messengers, through one of his prophets, and saying to the people, you've not been treating my word the way you're supposed to be treating my word. You've been harsh with my word. And so he goes on to say, Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? You have said it is uh, useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the proud blessed, for those who do wickedness are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. So the setting of the stage for where our main focus will be this evening in Malachi, the third chapter, specifically verses 16 through 18, is a very interesting and in many ways resonates with familiarity to the times that you and I are living in and trying to serve God in. The priests had become corrupt And they performed their duties as the priest with a dull sense of apathy. There was no enthusiasm. There was no uh, faithfulness. There was no real interest. There was no passion 
in the services that they conducted. When you look at uh, the book of Malachi, families were falling apart. Divorce was taking place. And family men were marrying those they had no reason or right to marry. The economy of uh, these people at this particular time was growingly depressed. The crops were being devoured by parasites. And sadly, the, the poor were being devoured by the rich. Sound familiar? Does it sound like 21st century? Well, listen a little more closely. What went wrong? Now, I know Eddie likes to have three words. And I've been asked, well, what are your three words? And I have been asked some other things about Eddie. <laughs> which are, are not going to be spoken tonight. I resolved to turn the other cheek but I reserve the right to get him at a better time. So what went wrong? Waiting year after year after year for the Lord's messianic kingdom to arrive, for things to get better. The people had become disillusioned. The people had become doubtful. So allow me to ask you this question before we go any further in our study. Do you ever get discouraged as a child of God? Do you ever find yourself doubting some things about God and about your relationship with God? Let me ask you this question. Now, you're going to find out I like to ask questions. So I'm going to ask a number of questions tonight, so you might as well not duck. Just sit there and take it and look at me and nod your head. Okay? Okay. I, I, not this. I want this. How, what, how would you rate your sense of spirituality this evening, tonight? 27th of March, 2022. How would you rate your level of spirituality? How would you consider yourself from the perspective of being a servant of the Lord? Okay, now that is all something that we can reason and rationalize with and justify and even excuse if we want to. But let me now ask you the question that we cannot do that with. And that question is, how does God view your faithfulness tonight? How does God view your service to Him? How does God look upon your life here and your life when you're not here, when you're at work, when you're at home, when you're out here in the world, what does God see that maybe we never see? Hopefully, prayerfully, rightly, we hope that what is seen here is exactly what is seen out there or a reasonable facsimile or very close to it. These folks had been promised the coming of the Messiah he still hadn't come and they were getting weary about all of that they were they were like the analogy that says you know there were passengers waiting for the train that never arrived he hadn't come and now they're beginning to wonder if he's ever going to come and after a while they simply if you read through Malachi they started giving up hope they started giving up hope and went back to their lives. Oh, they still went through the religious motions. They did that. They made the sacrifices, but they weren't the sacrifices that God had authorized. They weren't to the level of expectation that God had imposed upon them. They mouthed the words, but in their hearts, they, they, it almost appears as if they are wondering whether it's even worth it to serve God. Now, I want to address the young people in this audience for just a minute. We've got a good bunch right here, including uh, my second oldest grandson. And I'm delighted and proud to see him sitting up there. But I want to tell you something. We've got to understand 
And we've got to help our young people to understand now, at this age, at this time in their life, that serving God and making any sacrifices that have to be made are well worth whatever has to be sacrificed to please and honor our God. Am I right or am I wrong? We have to be able to do that, and we must if we're going to be pleasing and acceptable to the Lord. Their faith had withered to almost a, a place of cynicism. Their love for God's law was being transformed, and they were almost becoming callously indifferent. Now, I want to warn you and caution you about something. And when I preach to you, I preach to me. And what I'm saying to you is, don't say that that can't happen to you or will never happen to you. I can't tell you the number of brothers and sisters in Christ over the years that I have known, that I have counseled, that I have tried to restore and bring back who found themselves in a place that they never dreamed they would be. And I've had them ask the question, how did I get here? Two questions. Did you keep reading your Bible? No. Did you pray? No. When you cut off yourself from Bible study, when you cut yourself off from prayer, you are committing spiritual suicide. Now that's just as plain as I can make it, and I don't mean it to be harsh. I don't mean it to be hard. I'm really, uh, I, I'm just a gentle teddy bear. In fact, I'll just let you know in case you don't know, my grandkids all call me Papa Bear. Isn't that cute? I'm Papa Bear, and my wife, well, that goes with it. She's honey. So that's kind of, that's what I'm saying. The prophet Malachi's mission, here's what he had charged by the Lord to do. To light the lamp of faith in a disheartened people, reminding them that God had kept, that God was keeping, and that he would keep all that he had said he would do. If you will turn back a page in, in your Bible to Galatians, maybe on the same opening, in Mal Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, the Lord says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. And so we need to understand that what God's expectations of people back then, although under a different covenant arrangement, was in so many ways not different from the covenant relationship that we are in today. All God has ever wanted of His people, all, is their heart. It is our responsibility as parents and as grandparents to help our, our sons and our daughters and our grandsons and our granddaughters to acquire a faith of their own, not our faith, their faith. So when they're with their friends at school or when they're at work or wherever it is they might be or they go away to college or they find themselves in the military, that they have established their own level of faith to be able to defend who they are and what they believe and why. Are you listening? It's a great responsibility. It's a great privilege but it is an awesome responsibility because I tell you, the Bible says we will answer for what we do or fail to do in that regard. The prophet's words become a signal to all of us not to lose sight, to lose sight of, of God's promised hope, to persevere in our trust of him to stay alert, and to keep our lamps trimmed, not run short or run out of oil in our lamps. You and I, ladies and gentlemen, we need to keep making sure that we're putting more oil in our lamps. We need to make sure that we are growing in our faith 
in our service and in our commitment to God. So the parallels to then and now, to say the least, are very striking. The nation of Israel had strayed from God, far from God, and the days were not getting any better. Sin abounded, and the majority were paying little thought and giving little thought to the will of God or to the ways of God. Does that sound vaguely familiar to our society right now? Let me give you a few for instances just for you to mull over in your mind. Prohibiting the reading of Scripture in public schools. Prohibiting prayer in public schools. Prohibiting the display of the Ten Commandments in public schools. Prohibiting the teaching of creation in public schools along with evolution that is being taught. Increasing approval for abortion. Shall I go on? One more. Not only tolerance, but increasing and growing acceptance of homosexuality. And I, I'm here to tell you this evening, not anything that you don't already, don't already know, but I want to remind you. That's a lot for us to digest, and that can be a lot and cause us to really drop our, our arms and have weak knees and be somewhat discouraged. But, but I want you to wait a minute before you're discouraged another moment. Because what I want to tell you this evening, even in the midst of all this darkness, God had a remnant. He had a group of people, not many, but a group of people that loved him, that talked about him, that esteemed him, that honored him, and that served him. I want to tell you something else. When you read what the Lord heard this remnant of people in Malachi saying among themselves, the more the ungodly, the more the irreverent spoke against God, against whether it was worth it or not, the more his remnant, his special treasure, his special jewels, well, they spake among themselves to God and about God even more. Now, I just gave a really quick summation. In fact, I could just quit right here. Don't you even think about it. I'm just getting started. Because there are some things that we need to really, really think about. He had a people who revered his name and who sought to do his will. They wanted their children and their children's children to revere and respect and honor his will. Do we? Do our children, do our grandchildren see in our lives that God is in fact can make you uncomfortable? But God never makes us uncomfortable without writing the prescription to make us feel better, to help us get better. And that's what we need to consider and, and think about. We shall see three things about his people, this remnant. Number one, they talked about the Lord. Number two, they thought about the Lord. And number three, well, they encouraged and strengthened one another in the Lord. Do you know how encouraging it is to me to be here with you, each of you tonight? Eddie is very fortunate, and he knows it. It is a blessing to be able to, to, to come up here 
and to have the responsibility to be able to impart truths from God's Word. The challenge is to meet what are the most significant and important needs of that time. And I know Eddie would be the first one to tell you and Angie the second. There's a lot of mental gymnastics and a lot of looking in your heart to decide what you're going to preach. These folks truly wanted to do what was right, just like so many of you here tonight, by your presence, are showing that that is case. So, let me just ask two questions for right now. Number one, would you consider yourself to be like the remnant described in Malachi chapter 3? Would you consider yourself to be among that number? First question. Second question, a little tougher. That question will be posed like this. Does your life, do your words, do your actions say so? But I'm going to ask you one more question that is the most serious of all. How does God look at you as part of the remnant? Does he see in you? Does he hear in you? Does he observe? Does he notice? Is he aware of someone who deeply loves him and wants to serve him and honor him and give him the glory and give him the praise? And prepare oneself so that when this life is over with, when they stand before the judgment bar of the Lord, they can hear the Lord say to them, Well done, you've been a good and faithful servant. Enter. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to hear that. And the older I get, the more I want to hear that. And I don't want to do anything to mess that up. Does that mean I'm perfect? Oh, just ask my wife. Ask my kids. Ask my grandkids. And if they won't tell you, I'll tell you. I'm far from it. But you know what? I'm a child of God. And I have a venue and an avenue when I sin to come before his throne in prayer. And ask him to forgive me of my sin. And I have the assurance that when he sees in my heart that I am genuinely repenting of that, he forgives me just as he does you. That is priceless. It is priceless. We have so much to be thankful for and grateful for. So, very quickly then, if you've got a copy of the Custer Connection... Uh, there's two main points listed there, and actually there is a third, but I didn't put that on there. Uh, Eddie indicated it had to be brief. So I made it just as brief as I could make it. Anybody who knows me knows that brief really doesn't fit my vocabulary. So we're going to be covering a number more verses tonight. So I'll just ask you to fasten your seatbelt. Get back against the back of the bench, get set, and get ready, because we're going to go on a little tour. We're going to go on a little journey. And I want us to think about what we're talking about. What, the question that we've asked is, what, what was God doing during this time when here is all this deterioration within his people? Things are obviously going downhill in so many directions. There is such disrespect. There is, there is so much apathy and complacency when it comes to God and a relationship with Him. He looks upon that and, and you know, you think, He must think, look at all I have done for you. And in fact, 
He makes that argument repeatedly throughout the prophets. I have done this for you. I have done this for you. And ladies and gentlemen, he has done so much for each of us. Right or wrong. Think about it. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. And the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. You know what he did? There's nothing, we know there is nothing that escapes the knowledge of God. I think we all understand that, that he is unlimited in his power, that he's not restricted by any boundaries or place, that his knowledge is insurpassable. We can't even begin to think about how knowledgeable he is. And the more we learn, we're just, we're just scratching the surface to what he knows. But he, he gave attention to this, gr this group of, of his people, to this remnant of his people, and he listened and he heard what they were saying. And it pleased him. It pleased him. God heard that and, and it's almost as if he could say, they're, they're talking about me. They're talking about my word. They're talking about my will. They're talking about a relationship with me. I have people who love me. Now, we know God knows all of that, but I want us to understand, not a single word, not a single word was missed. Not a single word was overlooked. He took notice of everything and everyone. I don't know what you're thinking right now. I hope I do. I hope you are thinking about Malachi chapter 3 and saying, wow, that is really a, a great text. And that is an eye-opener. I don't, I don't want you to say anything about me. It just hurt my feelings. God knows what you're thinking. And we need to teach our kids from an early age that they need to learn how to listen. It's a wonderful thing about the notebooks and the holding up of the notebooks and the three words. I guess I could use three words tonight and those three words could be listen very carefully. But obviously there is no PowerPoint. It's not that I can't. I just know I think I know just how to get up and preach. And I'm perfectly happy with doing just that. Eddie does wonderful. See, I'm turning the other cheek. He does wonderful with the PowerPoint. More power to him. He heard their conversations. Now, I, we've got, a, we're blessed in this congregation with so many young families. And so many new babies are coming into the world and others are waiting for new babies to come into this world. And I can, I could, I could just about 100% guarantee you that in every one of those homes where there's a little baby, where there's a little one, there is a monitor that is in the room in that nursery wherever that little one or those little ones are sleeping. And parents have to learn to be keen to the sounds that they hear through that monitor. And if something doesn't sound right, if something does not appear to be as it should, a concerned father or mother, probably the mother, will get up. The husband will just nudge the wife and say, it's your, you got the call. Let me know if you need anything. But we pay attention to that. 
And we should, rightly so. I'm not going to ask you this evening if you've ever listened in on somebody else's conversation. Kids do. Not only do they listen into one another's conversations, they listen into their parents' conversations when they can. It's just human nature. God was eavesdropping on his own people. And what he was hearing, it was sweet to the sound. Let that sink in for just a minute, please. Just, just think how quiet it is here right now. There's a reason for that. We need to be quiet. We need to practice stillness. We need to practice attentiveness. And God's people, they were talking about him. They were revering his holy name. They were talking about his wonderful ways. The Lord was tuned in to their frequency and he was listening, listening so carefully to all of their remarks. And he was pleased. The Lord says that he enjoyed it and was pleased so much that he wrote their names down in the book. Now, I know sometimes there are some commentators who will say, well, now God didn't need to have a book because his memory is perfect. And I understand that. And I wouldn't argue on that point. But I truly believe that the, the figure of their names being written in the book was to build them up and encourage them and strengthen in them to know that God had not only taken notice of what they were doing, he wrote it down. Oh, how encouraging that had to be to that remnant. And how encouraging it should be to each of us. I, I'll make no bones about it. I want my name in that book. And I can't force my way into that book. I can't make my name go into that book. And anybody's name who will be in that book, it will be by the grace and mercy of God. But God does have his expectations of us to get there. And so it is significant. He listens to our conversations, to our prayers, to those times when we share the messages of the gospel with others. To the words of encouragement that we offer to one another. If you walk around in this building, if you walk around in any, in any meeting house where God's people are assembled, before and after services, if you're just walking around, you will hear encouraging words. Are you an encourager or are you a discourager? You have the power to choose. But just think about that for a moment. Many of us have concerns of, of what's going on around us and with the world in which we live. And we wonder, sure we wonder, what penalty is God going to put upon this nation for its turning away from him? The wise man Solomon worded it this way by inspiration in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 34. He said, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Sobering words, my friends. So then we wonder, well, what can we do? What can I do? What is it that we can do in this world in which we, we live. What about my family? How are my kids going to, how are my kids going to get along in this world? If you as a parent are not thinking about that, then may I kindly and respectfully and lovingly say to you, shame on you. I worry about my grandkids. What kind of world they're going to they're grow up and live in? And when they have their families, what kind of world will their children 
my great-grandchildren if I were fortunate enough to live long enough? What kind of world are they going to live in? How are they going to survive? How are they going to make it? I will tell you how they will not make it. They will not make it if we don't work with them and teach, with, teach them and be patient with them and love them. Some have their own, they all have their own will and I truly understand that because we have the sadness in our own family of one of our children who has left the Lord and, and left the faith. And I can tell you that there is not a day that goes by not a day that I don't shed tears we want our kids to, to, to make it so what, what can we do I have one word for you now I, I come from the generations way back when we used chalkboards and porcelain boards and so it seems odd that I don't have a, a chalkboard that I can go over here with a big old piece of railroad chalk and write this word that I'm about to share with you. So I want you to use your imagination and I want you just to pretend that either it's on the screen or on a chalkboard or on a marker board. And here's the word I want you to visualize. Continue. What can we do? What can you do? What can I do? What can we do? We can continue. That's what we can do. We can continue to honor him, to trust him. Continue to offer praises to him. Continue to come to Bible class. Continue to come to worship services and worship him. To have fellowship with one another. We can continue in that. And we can continue to talk of God's goodness and we, brothers and sisters in Christ, can continue to encourage one another. I need that, don't you? We all need it. In verse 17, I want to notice now, he says, They shall be mine, talking about that remnant, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. First of all, God says they're, they're mine. They're going to be mine. But there's an interesting word that is used in this passage. It is used in two other passages in the Old Testament and then Surprisingly, it is also in the New Testament. Well, maybe I should say not so surprisingly. It's in the New Testament as well. And it is that word jewels which comes from a Hebrew word, segula, S-E-G-U-L-A. It's a very interesting, it's a very interesting word, and it, and it means in translation. If you're taking notes, I, I would encourage you to write this down. God's very own special possession or treasure. God's very own special possession or treasure. Now, let's turn back for just a moment very quickly. I want you to turn to uh, the book of Exodus, the 19th chapter. And in Exodus chapter 19 we find our word showing up in verse 5. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me, there's our word, above all the people for all the earth is mine. Now, Turn over, please, very quickly to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. 
The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. There's our word. The segula, the segula, that's, that's who his people were. But lest we become discouraged and say, well, that was for them and uh, that doesn't apply to us now, please turn very quickly to the book of 1 Peter, uh, the second chapter. And in 1 Peter, the second chapter, and I um, am going to go ahead and say, and I'm not going to encourage a one of you to turn around and look at the clock. And I'm not going to encourage you to, don't you look at your wristwatch. Don't you even pay attention to it. I'll just save you the, I'll save you the misery. I've already gone over <laughs> against my wife's instructions, against my daughter's instructions, against my own instructions. But you know what? <laughs> You're listening so well, you're wearing me out. Listen to what Peter writes by inspiration in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. Because he's talking about you, and he's talking about me. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Are you one of those special people? There are Christians, and then like the saying goes, and then there are Christians. Some are Christians in name only. Some are Christians out on the, on the peripheral. They're out on the edge. But thank goodness for the ones who are so committed that they don't want to even be close to the peripheral area of life. They want to be right in the center, in the bullseye of being in Christ and serving Him. Does that describe you? Well, what were the faithful doing? I'm going to have to really fly now. Because there's, there's three points here. <laughs> and I've still got an application to make. You're thinking, application? Man, you've already been making applications. I'm not done yet. Number one, what were the people doing? They remained true to God. Everybody around them. Perhaps family members. People they worked with. People lived next door. People they knew. People they were very close to. Were falling away. But they were holding on. And they were faithful. They were remaining true to God. You and I are living in a time, Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. There will be a time, if you've not already experienced it, when as a, a person of God, something is going to be said, something's going to be done, that you're not going to be able in good conscience to accept, to go along with, and to give verbal or physical approval to it. The question is going to become, what will I do when that moment arrives? And it will arrive. And it will arrive for our young people. And it is arriving much earlier with young people than past generations. Technology, gaining of knowledge, is expediting those kinds of things. The remnant, they said, let the world curse God. We're going to praise him. The remnant stood for righteousness in a wicked world. The remnant worshipped God regularly. They endured the ridicule of others. And God looked down on this group of faithful people and he said, they are going to be my special jewels 
my special possession, my special treasure. Very simply, God's Segula. His treasures remain as faithful in every situation as they possibly can. And I want to just stop for just a moment and I want to say something to you. And not a one of us in this audience tonight is perfect. Not a one. And if you think you are, then I, I don't know what's back here behind this wall, but I see Eddie go back in that door all the time. So if, if you think you're perfect, then I would invite you to step back there with me after services and let's talk. If I could get there before the elders. Ain't nobody perfect. But the Lord expects us to strive unto perfection and to do our best to be better, to grow and to mature. And that's what we need to understand. You're going to stumble. You're going to fall. You're going to make mistakes. You've, you've already done that. So have I. And God promises he'll forgive. Number two, this remnant esteemed his name. Look at verse uh, 16 back in Malachi, the third chapter. They spoke, then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. Well, what were they speaking? They were esteeming, they were honoring his name. They were in awe of the Lord. This remnant, they considered his majesty. They honored him by their words and by their lives. They remembered the mighty acts of God. They remembered his grace, his acts of mercy, and his acts of love. Turn with me for just a moment to uh, Psalm 1. It is a, a wonderful, wonderful passage of Scripture. In fact, I find myself venturing into the Psalms more and more because there is a gold mine. <laughs> and there are veins of gold that are running all through the Psalms. And they're just waiting for us to dig them out. Would you start digging if you haven't already? Listen to Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Here it is. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. That's what's on his mind. Is that what's on your mind? Please think about that. You know the answer to that question. I, I, I just want to make a, a, another side note. I've been in a lot of homes through the years when I was preaching full time and, and not only in local but, but also doing meeting work. And you know, you could always tell You could always tell when that family wasn't accustomed to offering a prayer before they ate. You could always tell. You know why? Because before we ever found the opportunity to express thanks, forks from the kids were already penetrating the food. Sometimes so were the parents. I want to tell you something, and I'm going to say it as kindly as I can say it. If, if you're the only person in a 500-mile radius, and you sit down in a chair or on a tree stump or on the bed of your truck, and you get ready to eat something, you give thanks to God. Give thanks to him for providing that, for watching over you. Our children must grow up learning to be grateful and learning to be thankful and learning to be appreciated, appreciative of all that God does. We need to be mindful of that. Thirdly, they spoke about God to one another. When these folks got together, they, they weren't gossiping. They weren't feeling sorry for themselves. They weren't complaining. They weren't arguing. They weren't criticizing. 
They could have. Probably had a lot they could have talked about. But they needed to talk about the Lord. Did you hear that? They needed to talk about the Lord. I, I, need, I needed to talk about the Lord tonight. I don't know if the Lord will grant me another opportunity and after tonight and my going over the way it is, there will probably be a boycott if my name does show up on that list again. I understand that. I understand how that, I understand how that works. I can't resist. We can sit and watch an NCAA basketball game or games for hours. We can go to a football game. We can go to a baseball game. But somehow or another, and we can sit there for all the time of that game and that event. But there's something about the fact that we've got to be very punctual when it comes to our worship service. Where... Where do you read that? Is that in the book of uh, Jude, the second chapter or the third chapter? Be thou punctual when you assemble together as God's people. I did that one time to a high school class, Bible drills. See who could turn the passage fast and two boys in the back were just going, they were, they were, they were hands up every time, every time. I thought, nah, they're not, they're not that smart. They're not that quick. So I said, okay, Jude chapter 3, verse 10. Up went their hands. I said, okay, would you go ahead and read that for us? Surely you don't need to look at Jude to know that there's not three chapters in Jude. Lesson learned. And actually they came up and apologized to me. Go figure. Okay. God's special treasure, his jewels, they want to get together and they want to talk together and they want to encourage one another and say the right things to help build us up. And I, I'm not going to discourage that in one, one iota. That is, that's a wonderful thing to do. But I want to tell you right now, the word or words that will truly build someone else up. That will truly encourage someone else. Are the words that come and are on the pages of God's book. Turn to Acts 20 chapter, the 20th chapter. Paul and Luke's account of his meeting with the elders at Ephesus and he gives them some encouragement and some instructions and some marching orders. Verse 32, he says, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance, an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Have you been encouraged tonight? Have you been strengthened tonight? Have you been edified tonight? I want to tell you the world is watching an application very quickly. And if our faith means anything to us, they're watching. Is it real? Do they really believe what they espouse? Is it different? What do they see? What do they hear? Words of despair, doom, words of gloom, negativity, or words of hope? And encouragement. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 that we're the salt of the earth and we're the light of the world. That's who we are. We're God's people. And if you want to look at it in, by extension for right now, you could say we are the remnant. Are you active? Are there some changes you need to make in your life? What a sad occasion for God to look at the nation around the remnant. But what a beautiful thing that God focused his attention on the remnant. 
He knows us. He knows who we are. And I want to close by uh, reading something that I came across a number of years ago that I have saved, and I knew there would be a time that I would use it, and this is the time, and I will close. God's real treasures are not to be found in a bank or in a safety deposit box or in bricks and mortar. His real treasure is beside you, in front of you, behind you, across from you. His real treasure, it's you and it's me. We're, we are his special treasure. There is no higher honor. May we serve him with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our strength, and all of our mind. I uh, am not going to make an apology for the length of this lesson tonight. I knew in my heart of hearts that when it came time, <laughs> I had too much to say. So I've said it. I have three things to ask you very quickly. Number one, when you leave this building tonight and you walk out in the parking lot to your vehicle, would you ask yourself this question? How can I be more like that person that's a remnant today that I wasn't yesterday? And what do I need to do to get there? Number two, then, when you get in your vehicle with your spouse or with your children or whoever, I want you to say something to them and say, you know, how, how can we, how can we help each other be that remnant? Thirdly and lastly, before you pillow your, put your head down on that pillow tonight, you get on your knees. If you can't get down on your knees, that's all right. I, I, I can't get down on my knees very well anymore. Whatever you got to do, you pray. And you ask God, please, please help me to be a better part of the remnant. He will answer your prayer. But he has expectations. Are you here tonight? And you're not ready to meet God. Well, oh, my friend, you need to be ready. Because we don't know when he's coming. If we're not ready to meet him, all it will cost us is our soul. Jesus said, what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Do you need to obey the gospel tonight? We're here to help you. Eddie can be down here so fast ready to sit down and talk to you and encourage you and then take you back and help you to be buried with Christ in baptism to become a new creature and you have started your journey to be part of the remnant. Are you hearing you're, you're a child of God you've not been faithful like you need to be? You're not the first. You won't be the last. But you are you. And you're accountable for you. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation tonight in whatever way or manner, please accept the Lord's invitation while together we stand and while we sing.